Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Co-op this Thursday morning. We have a little rain outside, which is good for the plants and the flowers and the trees. Ah, and we have one line with us this morning, Mr. Doug O'Brien. Doug, good morning. Good morning, Vernon. So good to be with you again today. It is a pleasure to have you on, as always. And I hear you have a new position. I do. I'm still in the cooperative family and am now at the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA. I have been here for just over six months working with the team the leading voice here in the United States for cooperatives to build a better world. So tell us a little bit more about NCBA CLUSA. Absolutely. So NCBA CLUSA celebrated its centennial, uh, its 100-year birthday in 2016. So we're on, we're moving into uh, our second century here at NCBA. And we're the um, we're the apex organization, kind of the umbrella organization for cooperatives here in the United States. So we have membership from across all types of cooperative sectors, from worker cooperatives to electric cooperatives to the major agriculture cooperatives, housing cooperatives, food co-ops, and credit unions uh, and beyond, the purchasing co-ops and others. So this is the table here at NCBA Clusa for these co-ops to come together and to talk about the critical issues facing the cooperative movement. So we have an advocacy arm that we work on the Hill to make sure that uh, the policy and the resources, you know, support the cooperative movement from the federal side. And then we have a communication shop and, and we're building out a thought leadership platform to make sure that, um, that we're asking the most critical questions and, and getting the answers for the cooperative movement to make sure that it can continue to make a deep impact, a deep positive impact in today's society. NCBA CLUSA also does significant work overseas. We, we basically we leverage the energy and the commitment to that seventh cooperative principle of care for community, and we care for those abroad in emerging economies. We work in 19 different countries and 27 different programs, helping producer organizations, uh, food security, making sure that communities are as resilient as they can be. So we do a lot here at NCBA CLUSA, and uh, it's just a fantastic place to be. You said a lot. <laughs> and I know <laughs> NCB, I don't even know how one organization does as much as it does. But I know we, we celebrated them here last year with their 100-year celebration. So you're executive vice president of programs. That's right, Vernon. So that means I get to work with the people who are doing uh, the work here in Washington, D.C. and across the United States on cooperative development issues, uh, on that policy and advocacy, on communications. And I also get to work with the team that's, that's doing the international development work. So it's a, it's a great position to be, particularly for, you know, for someone I, as you know, Vernon, I was in public service before this, most recently at the White House and before that at USDA at the Rural Development Missionary doing community and economic development in rural places, in particular uh, places of persistent poverty. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, moving from from that type of mission-oriented work where you're, you know, trying to create economic opportunity and improve the quality of life using those federal programs. Now I'm in the private sector. I hear I'm in, you know, part of the cooperative movement trying to make sure that members of cooperatives can you know make the the biggest impact that they can in their community and their businesses so it's a it's been great it's been a great uh, transition so far there's a lot of potential i think one of the things i was most excited about as i came over a little over 6 months ago is we look at where society you know is today we think about some of the big challenges you know inequality we've got you know 3% 
of the population reaping about 50 percent of the income. We've got uh, a job. Now, you know, we have unemployment that's going down, but we know that a lot of people are underemployed, whether that's because of part-time employment or uh, their income isn't as great as it needs to be. And this sort of the rise of what, you know, the gig economy or the platform economy where people are more and more working for themselves and finding kind of bit work through the internet, and they don't have the job security that we used to have. So we look at these challenges, and from where I sit, I really think that that cooperatives, you know, that business model designed to benefit uh, the owners of a business, and those owners, we call them members, control that business. You know, this is a tool that I think is un- underutilized in society and in the economy today. And I think there's a lot of potential for this tool uh, to really empower people in, you know, what are for a lot of folks some pretty challenging times. Doug, I totally agree with you. And, I, and I've asked the question a hundred times is the benefits of co are so great. And this is why National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program so we can tell people about the benefits week in and week out. But then why aren't there more co-ops? It's well, amazing to me. Yeah. I think there's a number of reasons for that. You know, one is that when we look at the support for co-ops over time, and, you know, uh, particularly at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, but in some other places within the federal government and in state governments and in county governments, in the past there was more support for cooperative development. You know, co-ops, they take more deliberation, they take more time to organize, to make sure that it's a viable enterprise. You know very well, Vernon, and I'm sure most of your listeners do too, that the members of co-ops, you know, they enter into this business, into this ownership, into the control of this new endeavor in a very, you know, deliberate, strategic way that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of sophistication, and that takes some support, uh, sometimes some support from the outside. And I think that support has gone down over the past generation and two. And now we look, Vern, just this week, two days ago, the White House and the Office of Management and Budget released their proposal for a budget in 2018. And we saw that they are proposing to eliminate the, the relatively small program, the small dollars that remain in supporting co-op development at USDA, and they're proposing to eliminate that. I can tell you that that NCBA is working with its allies in the co-op development community, uh, is working with our friends on the Hill uh, that are part of the uh, cooperative uh, business caucus to make sure that that funding is restored and that it remains in 2018 and beyond. So I, I think that's one of the reasons that we've seen some reduced support. Another reason I think we need to look at ourselves, it's one of the things that's great about Uh, about the cooperative community is that we take responsibility for things. And the co-op community, I think, is guilty with, as so many other types of sectors, of talking to themselves a little too much. I think we need to think about partnering and to engaging in conversation with other sectors, with other thought leaders. In fact, just recently, you know, we got to see kind of the May co-op week. Vernon, I saw you at the that fantastic program, the Co-op Hall of Fame, just a, a three weeks ago. But mm-hmm. part of that week of events at the NCBA board luncheon that same day on May 3rd, I think it was, we brought in some folks from outside the cooperative community. We brought in folks from the uh, the Urban Institute, person who's leading a, a major project and looking at uh, mobility and making sure that that uh, people have an opportunity to climb the economic ladder. She spoke with our group for, uh, you know, for over that luncheon period, and we had an opportunity to share with her the the amazing tool that co-ops are to help people empower themselves in the economy. We had the president of the Rural Policy Research Institute talk about the work that they're doing in rural America, and and one of the uh, vice presidents for the American Sustainable Business Council talk about the work that they're doing. So these are just some of the partners that, that I think, you know, the cooperative community needs to make sure that it is communicating the value of co-ops to business, to community, uh, to society. And also, we can learn from these people, too. I've learned a lot from some of these outside partners and the way 
that they're thinking about impact community, the way that they're talking about mobility, the way that they're measuring success for families and businesses. So, you know, so I, I think that's just a couple of reasons. But there's there, there are things that we can do something about. And as a cooperative community, you know, the thing we do best is come together around, you know, critical challenges and opportunities. And I think that's what the cooperative community across the United States needs to do today is make sure it comes together to make sure that the entire country, the policymakers, the business community, those nonprofits and non-governmental organizations understand what co-ops can do, what they have done, and what they will do for people in the United States. You know, one of the things that I, I thought you were going to say, too, is that cooperators talk among themselves and they don't shout out all of the benefits that's promoting the, the corporate world just doesn't seem to happen that much. And again, that's why we're doing this show. It, it came out of that that vacuum of of the cooperators not saying, "Look at all of, all of the great things that we do, both in our businesses for our members, but also in the community communities." Because that's the seventh principle is concern for communities. When you talked about the seven principles, listen, Doug, I enjoy talking to you. There's so much to talk about because I want to talk about the program that you're working with. But we're going to take our first break, and then when we come back, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about why there aren't more co-ops and, you know, why would Mr. Trump take away the little bit of money that's there as opposed to putting more money into it. So um, we'll be right back, though. Please don't touch that dial. is power. Welcome back. This is Vernon Oaks. Everything Cooperative is the show you listen to, and we have Mr. Doug O'Brien, who's the Executive Vice President of Programs. And right before the break, he was addressing the question of why aren't there more co-ops? And Doug, my hypothesis is that the people in power, those one percenters, uh, the politicians, they more likely don't want people to know about co-ops because then the profits go to the everyday people and not to them. And it's amazing to me the people that have money seem like they want more and more and more and more and more. And to, if you got a billion dollars and you had and you just invested it and got four percent return, that's forty million dollars a year. It's kind of like, could I live on forty million a year? I mean, so I don't know why they just really want more and more money or more and more power, but when you have more and more co-ops, then people are much more engaged. You have to go through this training that you talked about. And that training, Doug, I've, Dr. Jessica Gore Nimhard has been on the show, and mm-hmm. the research, she said that after five years with that training and working together, 90% of the cooperatives are still in existence, where a normal corporation is more like 5% are still in existence after five years. So there's some real benefits and playoff and stability for the community and increasing wealth for the everyday people. So what do you think about yeah. my hypothesis is that there are some people that just don't want to promote co-ops, and it seems the people in power with lots of money. Well, I think there's something to that, certainly, Vernon. I mean, cooperatives are people-centered businesses. You know, while they absolutely need to be economically viable, And for most cooperatives, you know, part of the reason, and for a lot of cooperatives, it's the biggest part of the reason they exist is to make sure that its members can have economic opportunity and and, uh, really have a better position in the economy, in the particular market that they're dealing in. So cooperatives, you know, cooperatives are about, they're about money, but first and foremost, they're about people and serving you know, the priorities, uh, maintaining the consistency of the values of the people that are part of that cooperative, the members of that cooperative. And that isn't necessarily attractive to the people who have a lot of capital. They would prefer that businesses be organized in a way where, uh, you know, the people who have the most capital in the business have the greatest say. You know, that's I think that's a, a pretty straightforward, you know, observation. Just you know, this week we've had an interesting news story that I think touches on some of this. And Vernon, you might have been following the Buy Twitter campaign that a number of stockholders for Twitter for the last number of months have urged other stockholders to support sort of a path 
towards Twitter possibly becoming a cooperative. Just this week, Twitter had its annual membership or board meeting, and they received enough signatures, the supporters of this uh, by Twitter campaign, for the board to have to consider a resolution that would have Twitter conduct a study on the value of Twitter being converted to a user-owned or uh, perhaps uh, also employee-owned cooperative. Now, this this actually made some pretty big news. It was in Forbes. It was in Fortune. I think it was in Inc. and Vice and Salon and some of these uh, some of these pretty major publications. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happened was that the the target was really having at least three percent of the stockholders vote to support this study. And what happened is that there were four percent that supported the study, which meant that the idea of this study will continue to be on the agenda for uh, Twitter, and it can be brought up again next year. But the fact, maybe going back to your original point here, the management and the board itself didn't like this idea. In fact, very publicly stated that they thought it it was not uh, an effective use of the time and resources for Twitter, and they and they declined on doing the study this year, even though, even though, as the supporters of this campaign have pointed out, that Twitter, as a you know kind of a regular investor-owned C corporation, has significantly underperformed in the last years, providing very you know little value. In fact, declining, decreasing value to its stockholders. And what the uh, advocates for the Biden Twitter campaign point out is that we know that cooperatives build consumer loyalty. We've seen this in a number of different cooperatives. It can spur innovation because the members of the cooperatives are closer to the decision makers on uh, what the next steps, you know, how that cooperative can better serve the membership. So that's why the champions for this idea brought it forth. It's like, well, this this might be a platform where a cooperative makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. And and that conversation continues. And I think the the exposure of the cooperative business model to a you know to one of the major social media companies and the exposure that we've seen in the public sphere, I think is has been pretty encouraging. And that conversation will continue. You know, that will help with this promotion that we're talking about. But I I think it really goes back to, and you hit on it a little bit, the struggle between capital and labor. It's probably been a struggle ever since money was invented. (laughs) Okay. You know, you leave the barter system and you start talking about coins and stuff. Is that who has the coins, who has the rocks or whatever was used, and how do they get more? And this total struggle and sort of... Growing up in the coal fields, uh, blue-collar workers, I sort of leaned toward the labor side. Uh, Mm -hmm. Grandfather being in in the coal mines and my father being on the railroad, that uh, the unions and labor having a bigger say in the co-op seems to be the answer for both having uh, people to really understand the democratic process and and participate in it Mm -hmm. and getting a share of the wealth. So I I talked about redistribution of wealth and somebody took me wrong. I'm not talking about trying to get the people to have money to, to re up and divide up their monies, except that they pay, they pay their fair share of taxes. But I am talking about when a new dollar is made, you had mentioned 50%. I heard it. The number I have seen is the one percenters get 57% of every new dollar created in in the U S you mm-hmm. said 3% gets 50%. Either way, the 97 to 99, there's not that as much left for us. And that's why we have mm-hmm. such poverty and this gap is getting bigger and bigger. So how do we get the folks, the 97% or the, the even the people between the 50% or below, how do they get more money so that they can live a decent life? And you said co-ops, that's providing a, a service and a product that's quality and focus on their membership and providing, like you said, money, but it's that dividends and fair wage, a fair living so folks can live. I, that, I love co-ops, man. I love it. <laughs> and the reason I first liked it, Doug, was because of the fifth principle, and that's education, training, and information. Mm-hmm. And then I mm-hmm. just learned more over the years, but to, to educate people and the adult learners, I and mean, I've been in to different 
conferences and watch adult learners learn finances or leadership or group decision making. It's fascinating to watch it happen. I've taught for 12 years in my life. And when that light comes on, when people get it and adult learners get it, when they have to use it, this is just in time education. So anyway, mm-hmm. I, we can, you and I can sit here and talk all day about the benefits <laughs> and how much we love co op. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to do that, Vernon. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let's change the conversation a little bit to talk about what do you do and what programs does NCBA have that you are sort of the executive vice president over? Sure. So as I mentioned at the top, our programs, what they do is they, uh, in, in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different geographies, we make sure that the cooperative business model and that the cooperative principles are used as much as possible, you know, to, to build a better world. You're familiar with that phrase, Vernon. Yeah, absolutely. And we do that in a lot of ways. Uh, we do advocacy. So uh, we work with members in Congress, with the administration. Uh, we work with other stakeholders and efforts in, in state legislatures to make sure that, uh, that the policy is most conducive so that people can use the cooperative model. We have a communications shop to make sure that we're spreading the spreading the good word of cooperatives through a co-op weekly newsletter invite people to to get on uh, ncba.coop you can sign up for the newsletter you can also sign up for a new journal a journal that we really repurposed just uh, about three months ago called the cooperative business journal this is a quarterly virtual journal that goes deeper into uh, cooperative topics. The first one focused on empowerment, the use of cooperatives in empowering people and economy and society. The next one's looking at inclusivity. The The fall issue is going to look at the, the impact that cooperatives make in economy. And these these issues will have four or five in-depth articles from some of the the you know, the best thinkers around the cooperative community and digging into some of these issues. So we do advocacy. We do communications. Uh, we also do thought leadership. So uh, for, you know, we, we just announced during May Co-op Week the creation of the Council of Cooperative Economists, which numbers uh, 14 of leading economists and other experts in the cooperative sector to uh, to ask some of the most critical questions about opportunities and challenges facing the cooperative movement, uh, making sure that we're bringing together the best data and information, and we're presenting it in a way that's most compelling to different audiences. You know, you you asked earlier, Vernon, why aren't cooperatives being used more in the mm-hmm. economy and mm-hmm. in society? And I think I think we need to tell a better story. I mean, we have an amazing story, but I should say. We need to tell it in a more compelling way. Absolutely. So we're working on that here at, at NCBA, Clusa, to, to make sure that we do that. The, uh, we've got to, we've got to stop Go now for our second break, and we'll come back uh, and talk more about these programs and this communicate. We'll be right back. Great. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, Everything Cooperative, and with Mr. Doug O'Brien on the phone with us. He's the Executive Vice President of Programs for NCBA. So, Doug, you were talking about programs. We got advocacy, communications, and thought leadership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we also do some significant development work overseas, but I do want to come back to talk a little bit more about the thought leadership and really the communications and highlight two things that we have coming up in October that are a big deal for the cooperative community. The first is the Festival of Co-ops on the Mall. So on September 30 and October 1, uh, we're uh, working with the cooperative community to take over, you know, two or three blocks right on the nation's mall and bringing some of the, the cooperative names that, that, uh, that we know very well and, and building a, a village, if you will, of of cooperatives. Uh, This is designed for, you know, for families here in the region, for uh, the wonderful tourists that come visit Washington, D.C., so that people 
have a deeper understanding and appreciation that, you know, co-ops already make a huge impact. Vernon, you've asked the questions a couple times, why aren't, uh, you know, cooperatives used more? And I think that's, I think it's the right question. But, you know, we, we have to remind ourselves just how deep an impact cooperatives already make. One in three Americans are already a member of a cooperative. Uh, they account for, you know, about 120 million members in the United States, over 2 million jobs, 140 million customers. Uh, over 100 million Americans are part of credit unions. Uh, you know, the rural electric cooperatives service uh, about 75% of the geography of the continental United States and 17% and, uh, of the households in the United States. Uh, we've got major names like REI, like Lando Lakes. You know, they're, the co-ops are, are here. They've been here for well over 100 years. They make a deep impact. They're a big part of the economy. They need to be a bigger part. So we have the festival on the mall on September 30 and October 1 to help celebrate what co-ops already do and so that consumers can uh, can touch and feel, have fun. There will be music. There's going to be food. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a fantastic couple days. Carrying on through that week, for the cooperative community, we have the Cooperative Impact Conference out in Arlington in Old Town. That will be a two-day conference bringing together cooperative leaders across the country, bringing uh, some of the cooperative leaders from around the world to talk about how to measure the impact that co-ops have, to tell the sophisticated story about how cooperatives provide benefits to its members, to the community, to the economy, to society. We're going to focus on things such as worker cooperatives and how to finance cooperatives. We'll look at and how to measure and evaluate the impact that cooperatives make on the country. We'll look at how cooperatives here in the United States impact global development and a number of other key topics. So that's on October 4 and 5, the Cooperative Impact Conference. Again, please uh, take a look at ncba.coop. And we have some information. The registration is already open. We're providing more and more information as we uh, continue to develop that agenda. So those are two big things I wanted to mention today was the Co-op Impact Conference and the Festival of Co-ops. Uh, as I mentioned, in terms of the, the work that we do here on programs, uh, we also do that, that significant work uh, overseas in 19 different countries, helping emerging co-ops and producer organizations build those value chains, you know, many times in agriculture, but in other ways, too, to make sure that families in uh, emerging economies you know, have that stability. We work on resilience. We work on food security in these uh, 19 different countries. Hold on a minute, Doug. I want to go all the way back to your mm -hmm. impact conference. I'm looking at the calendar. That's the 4th and the 5th. The 5th is a Thursday. Mm -hmm. And my birthday is on the 7th, by the way. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the fifth, I want to see, I've talked to the studio here about seeing if I can take this show on the road, like what equipment would I need to be able to come there on the fifth and maybe have people that are in the impact that I could talk to, you know, three, four, five different people or so. So I want to explore that possibility. I, I want to be at the conference because measuring impact and promoting that impact so that more and more people will know about it, that, that's critical. And I want to bring up one more thing to talk about so I don't forget it, but, and then we'll go to the international piece. I spoke at uh, a hearing that uh, Councilman Vincent Gray had here in the district about they are wanting to put money together to build two grocery stores, one in, in uh, Ward 7, one in Ward 8 mm. on the east end of, of D.C., and then rent it to a big box, you know, somebody like Safeway or Giant, Mm -hmm. And when I first heard this a couple of months ago, I said to Mr. Gray, I would love to see co-ops go there so that not only would we, they are food deserts, they really are those two parts of town, mm -hmm. so that the people there could have all of the benefits that we just, that you were talking about. Uh, have a say mm -hmm. in what goes on, have a say what goes on the shelves, and when there's a surplus or profit, then they get the benefits back. And I, I shared uh, some research that was done on food co-ops that the people make a, at least a dollar an hour more than uh, folks in the, in the big box stores. 
and they have, uh, I think it was 68% had health insurance. We're on 50 some in the, in the regular grocery store. So there's a lot of benefits for the people in the community that work there and keep the money there and so forth. So I am looking to put together a group of people to help with this. There's already a group called uh, community co-op grocery. They started in 15, some DC, you know, uh, citizens, so they, mm-hmm. they have some already a group of people starting that, and so I'm wanting to put together and, and get your help on who all could we reach out to form this committee to educate, and that's what I was trying to do in the city council on the benefits of this so that if they do pass this, then at least have the co-op as one bidder, not just Harris Teeter and Giants and Safeway. So mm-hmm. trying to get the education and then put together – the people that understand this really well so we can put together a good proposal, a uh, compelling proposal. And, and there was another group, Park Something, they right off of 295, they had six or seven people testifying that they didn't know why they didn't have one of these stores in their area. Mm. And so when I spoke, I said, you know, the food co-op footprint is about the half the size of the regular store in square footage. And so maybe if you had enough money to do, to build two, you could really build four food Mm co-ops and get, Mm -hmm. and get fresh vegetables and, and fruits in different areas of, of town that don't have it right now at a, at a decent price that pays people a decent wage. It seems all of the benefits of co-ops that you and I know about could be really wonderful in the nation's capital in providing food in areas where, and they talked about, Different people, I think there were 70 people to talk. Uh, it was supposed to start at 11, be over at 1. When I left at 4, <laughs> that's mm. what time I got, there were still people to testify. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of interest. Uh, and two other people talked about co ops. One didn't know they were talking about co ops. They talked about the Evergreen <laughs> Project in Cleveland, yeah. where the universities and the, and the hospitals, because they're looking to building another hospital, getting money together to build a hospital in Southeast D.C. also. So I'm gonna need help and find out who the right people to come together to work on a proposal for the city to to build two to four food co-ops in DC. Well, Vernon, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff right there. The number one, very happy to to talk with you. There's some some excellent work in our network, our membership here at NCBA on you know analyzing and explaining the benefits of of food co-ops to meet the challenges on access to healthy and and fresh food at affordable prices. Uh, You know, as a resident of the D.C. region, I'm I'm certainly interested uh, in in that project and would love to to touch base and and continue to to talk with you about that. Number two, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, just this, this idea of cooperatives in a city. Vernon, you know, I grew up in a farm in Iowa, so I, mm-hmm. you know, our family were members of a number of different co-ops in the upper Midwest and our electric co-op. And, you know, that's how we got feed, the fertilizer and the inputs for the crops. But in cities, more and more mayors and city council people are recognizing the power of the cooperative model to help build community, you know, in their particular cities. And in fact, one of the, the plenary panels at the Cooperative Impact Conference on October 4 and 5 are going to feature a number of these mayors and city leaders from uh, we're still finalizing uh, exactly where, but, you know, we're talking to folks in Rochester, New York this afternoon. I have a conversation with some people in New York city. Uh, Philadelphia is active in this Minneapolis, Madison, um, you know, Austin, uh, Oakland. There's, there's a lot of places that are looking at this and we'd love to bring more of that activity here to Washington, DC. And we'd love for people to come to the conference on October 5th, that panel will be on the 5th, to see those mayors and those city leaders talking about why they recognize cooperatives as a key strategy in building their city. And October 5th would be a fantastic day to have Vernon uh, camp out at the Impact Conference and to talk to these people from across the country and some from across the world who are working to build the cooperative model. We'd, We'd love to have you there, Vernon. We hope Hope we can uh, can figure that out to, to get you there to whether it's broadcast live and, and or uh, make sure that you have a chance to access and, and tape uh, some of these fantastic people that will be there. So that's the the second thing. And then 
The third thing, October 7th, happy birthday, Vernon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is also the cooperative 5K run. Uh, so the Cooperative Development Foundation has an annual run that they do right here in Washington, D.C., and uh, and that 5K run happens on your birthday. So we'll see you out there. Uh, I'll put a, a candle and a cupcake, and, <laughs> and you and I will well, we'll go around Haynes Point. How about that? Well, let's make it a piece of fruit and a candle. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh i'm putting that 5k run in my calendar right now i Good. did do it one year at haynes point i think is where they had it that's right yeah and that's where it'll be again this year yeah it's a great event it's a great event there's people from the region but then there's some some folks who choose to stay on you know on kind of the october cooperative week and the impact conference they'll stay on uh, for that extra day, and we, in fact, on that Friday of that week, we're, we're working on some special programming uh, uh, as extended to the Co-op Impact Conference, and then move right into that 5K run. And it's a fundraiser that helps support the work of the Cooperative Development Foundation, which, of course, does the Hall of Fame. But the Cooperative Development Foundation also works on, um, you know, some critical development issues for the cooperative movement. For instance, now they're they're working on uh, a, a multi-year project with many partners around home health care, um, looking at that prospect of using the cooperative business model to fill the very critical societal need and the, and the growing need for people to have that care at home, uh, that health care at home for, for so many reasons. So that's the Cooperative Development Foundation run on October 7th, the Co-op 5K. Fantastic. You know, um, we're getting ready to go into our last break, and I want to come back and talk about what you're doing overseas and the programmatic kinds of things you're doing overseas. I just had to get that in about D.C. because I know we'll run out of time. And don't forget Richmond, Virginia. You didn't mention them, but they created an office Mm -hmm. of building wealth from that book, Cities That Build Wealth, and Madison, a lot of the New York was in there, the amount of money they put together for worker cooperatives. We're going to take our last break, and then we'll be right back, and I want to go right into what you're doing internationally. We'll be right back. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Everything Cooperative is the show you're listening to. and We have Mr. Doug Bryan, who's the Vice President of Program for NCBA. And, Doug, right before we went off, I mentioned the office the, in Richmond. It's Office of Community Wealth Building, the city of Richmond. And in that is creating co-ops. It's a part of that wealth building. Good, good, yeah. So now we want to talk about, you had started talking about what you're doing internationally. So let, let's developing overseas. Yeah, that's right. So for almost 60 years, NCBA CLUSA has been working with people overseas to utilize the cooperative principles and the cooperative business model to empower people in emerging economies and developing economies. The work that we do is based on the seven cooperative principles. We call it the NCBA CLUSA approach. And, you know, it's focused on the people who live in those communities as the decision makers when it comes to solving uh, their community's most pressing development needs. This this approach is a community-led approach. It seeks to empower the people so that they can, you know, voice and promote and manage sustainable, locally generated solutions so that when we're no longer there, that they have the tools to be successful. As I said, you know, over the years, we've been in 88 countries. Right now, we're in about um, 19 or or 20 countries, uh, mostly in Africa, also in Latin America and Southeast Asia. We're in places like uh, a major project in Senegal, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Niger, uh, in, in about seven or eight other countries in Africa. We're also in Indonesia, in Timor. Uh, and then in uh, Latin America, we do a lot of work with uh, with farmers, whether that's uh, quite a few with coffee co-ops, but other co-ops in El Salvador, in Guatemala, and uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And we've also led a U.S.-Cuba cooperative working group that uh, we've been leading on for uh, just uh, over the past 
year and put out a major report about two months ago looking at how Cuba and the people in Cuba, as, as they more and more are transitioning their economy, are looking at the cooperative business model to be, uh, you know, the, the, the way to make sure that, that people can sustain in their economy. So we do a lot of work. We, we, are, uh, we, we partner with uh, USAID. We partner with the USDA Foreign Ag Service, as well as a number of other private partners and, and national governments to make sure that those cooperative principles can be utilized in a way to empower people and community to determine and, uh, and their own successful future. Well, Papa Sin out of Senegal mm-hmm. was on a program when he was inducted in the Hall of Fame three and a half mm-hmm. years ago, and he said, co-ops solve community problems. He mm-hmm. said, if there are no community problems, there's no need for a co-op. <laughs> I like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Papa Sin, he's, he's really, I think, the godfather of that Clusa approach that I talked about. And I'm not sure that he'd call himself that. I actually was talking to one of my colleagues here who had just talked to Papa Sin uh, last week when he was in Africa, uh, when my colleague was in Africa doing some work. And Papa Sin and so many other people at NCBA Clusa, and in fact, you know, in the cooperative movement, are really truly social entrepreneurs. You know, they're utilizing the power of the cooperative as a business model to. Uh, improve people's place in society. Uh, and they're doing it, I'd say, entrepreneur, because they do it with some risk. You know, it's, you ask these uh, these people in community, the members, the citizens of different communities, to do this a little bit different way, uh, to, to risk their place in that community, you know, to seek the benefit of people coming together uh, in the cooperative business model. So, you know, NCBA Clusa has been you know, really happy to be able to work as a domestic cooperative community to kind of leverage that power and really look to that sixth cooperative principle of cooperation among cooperatives and then that seventh principle of concern for community to improve people's livelihoods across across the world in emerging economies. Well, Papa Sin had an amazing story. And that same year, a lady by the name of Harriet May uh, got inducted into the Hall of Fame. And the reason I bring up those two, because they're small in statue, but very, very, they carry a big stick. And so I thought that their story would make an excellent uh, children's book to talk about the Mm -hmm. principles. And so it's like looking at different people in the Hall of Fame that maybe and I'd love to work with you or somebody else on that, too. I've been looking to see if I could find somebody that writes children's books and give them their mm-hmm. story to see if they could write out something and see what that would cost to get that into publication. But we got to promote it, and I'm looking for every way we can promote it. I've also just talked to a songwriter about maybe creating some songs about co-ops. And as I've researched it, I've only seen one or two, and they're, they're okay. But I'd like to see us get more songs out about co-ops. So compelling love story very spiritual but not a religion (laughs) (laughs) i I like all those ideas meredith those are great ideas love to work with you on them well dame pauline green was on the show she was the president Mm -hmm. of the ica international cooperative Mm -hmm. alliance and her quote that i took away was co-ops bring people out of poverty with dignity Mm -hmm. how do they Mm -hmm. do that I have an idea, but just wanted you to speak to that quote. They do it because they empower the people to help themselves and to help themselves in economy. You know, so much of the the very well-intended work and and development over the years, and I think a lot of the thinking has been changed. I think the last uh, administration in particular around the, the, the development work has, has changed this, but even to this day, uh, when people think about trying to help folks that are on the lowest rung of the economic ladder or in a community that lacks a lot of the basic you know, infrastructure, education, health, et cetera, that a lot of people think, well, the best thing you can do is, is, uh, is give them a fish, you know, give them some resources, provide them some food, some basic health care, which, of course, might be important for that moment, but what Many others think, and I think the the CLUSA approach, you know, really the the cooperative movement, what it is designed to do, what it wants to do is provide people the tools to be successful on their own, 
That's the and, education. Uh, it's, you That's know, the one of the principle. one of the great paradoxes of, of cooperatives is that they are about making sure that people can be, you know, independent of outside support, that they can be successful on their own. But what it takes is people working together, you yep. know, citizens in that community coming together uh, to take care of their own needs. Well, cooperative values are like self-help. You mentioned that. Self-responsibility. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that. Democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. And this part is what I like the best. In the tradition of their founders, cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. So another charge I would like to charge you with, Mr. O'Brien, is can you get the people in the House and in the White House and in the Senate to come and get some training (laughs) in cooperative value? (laughs) (laughs) Honesty, openness, social responsibility, (laughs) and caring for others. (laughs) <laughs> well, let's. Uh, I'll, I'll assign him a couple chapters from Jessica's book, and we'll we'll have a cooperative learning circle. Maybe right. you could lead a few of the discussions, <laughs> Vernon. Yeah, you know, you, is it touching on the, the the federal family. You know, we do uh, many times, and there's a lot of reason to do it. Sometimes is, is point out some of the you know some of the the uh, the shortcomings of our House representatives and, and Senate and, and the administration. But but I have to say that there are a number of people in federal elected office who understand the value of co-ops, and they stand up for co-ops. Last year, NCBA Clues to uh, help put together uh, the Congressional Cooperative Business Caucus, led by Representative Royce, a Republican from California, and Representative Mark Polkan, a Democrat from Wisconsin. And now we have 14 uh, members of Congress who are part of that caucus. Uh, that, that number continues to grow. There is support and understanding in some quarters on the Hill, and we're going to need it in yep. this next year because, as, as I mentioned uh, just this week, we saw the detailed budget from the administration that slashed many of the programs that are so important to cooperatives, whether that's supporting rural electric cooperatives in their task of, of uh, distributing you know, affordable electricity to, to people in rural America, to hey, Doug, the cooperatives that do, Doug, yes. We only have one minute, so what would you like to leave people with? What I'd like to leave them with is you know, the cooperative business model is more relevant today than it has ever Never been. been. The challenges that, that face society around inequality around the future of work, around climate change, around so many of these, the cooperative business model with its values of, of uh, self-help, with its values of people coming together to empower themselves in their business, in economy, through democratic principles. It's a tool that needs to be looked to, uh, and it's going to help answer some of these questions. But it's going to take a lot of work as a cooperative community to make sure people understand it. And an uh, NCBA CLUS is here to to, uh, to be a table for people to come together and make sure that cooperatives can make the most positive impact uh, in the United States and around the world. Well, keep doing what you do. I really like what you're doing and the movement from rural development to the White House, the NCBA. Thank you, buddy. It's always a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Vernon. And everybody out there, have a cooperative week. 